Hello, and thank you for joining us again today with a discussion around security and storage area networking. I'm fortunate enough today to have a friend of mine, Brian Sherman, who's a distinguished engineer in the IBM Storage Group, uh, along to talk about this, this topic. And I think, you know, one of the things that's really, really critical for people to remember is that there is no end to this security conversation. There is, you know, I, I'd, I'd love to be able to tell you that at some point you're going to be able to lock the last door, right? Put the key in your pocket and life is good, but that's not actually what's going to happen. The development of new attacks and new new issues uh, continues. This is very much going to be a journey that, that continues uh, along for as long as IT infrastructure exists. So it becomes more and more critical to be thinking about this, not just in terms of when we talk about disaster tolerance or disaster recovery, right? You know, people have a tendency to think about hurricanes, floods, power outages, and so on. But that disaster can also be a security disaster. It can be a hack. It can it can be the sort of thing that that takes down major chunks of infrastructure or natural gas pipelines in in the case of the the continental uh, ransomware attack, right? So that that conversation is one that we we need to have and we need to understand. And there's standardization that's coming with this as well. So there's there's legislation that's forcing people now to disclose when they've paid ransomware. Um, uh, demands, right? And so that so that you know as, as a consumer whether or not your your data was potentially exposed. But it also speaks to how rapidly we recover. So the, so the DORA standard in the European Union now speaks to how rapidly the systems need to be able to recover. So there's this this concept of a recovery point objective. So how much data can be lost in that environment and a recovery time objective. How rapidly can we get the applications back online? Because whether we're talking about finance, air traffic control, uh, healthcare environments, you know, whatever it might be, right? Those those scenarios include infrastructure, IT infrastructure with storage area networking backends that have to be there, have to be up, have to be in place all the time, and or recovery uh, of those systems in a in a very rapid mechanism, right? So again, that that recovery point objective or recovery time objective. So Brian, perhaps you could walk us through a little bit of that conversation. Yeah, and, and certainly, you know, again, we're we're seeing um, in, in some differences here around, you know, high availability, disaster recovery, and separating uh, out cybersecurity and cyber recovery. Most of our customers have a, a very well defined, you know, availability, disaster recovery, you know, RPO and RTO that, that 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 you just mentioned. But when it comes to cyber, uh, it's a whole different entity that, that we have to walk and, and talk to our customers through around, okay, what are you planning for in terms of a cyber event? And that's where things like, like DORA or the Digital Operations Resiliency Act for EMEA uh, comes into play. And you're right that it, it's, it, you know, it, it's, it's there now, uh, but it will become you know, January uh, 2025 is when it comes into effect. And in, in for, for all of you, think around GDDR and the in the privacy. It, now this is around security and what DORA is doing for EMEA. Um, the UK has a similar um, uh, regulation uh, around FCA. And, and again, it's around recovery times. And, and as we understand, we'll see US and Canada following right shortly over, over the next little while with similar regulations to FCA and, and DORA the, that exist in the UK. Other different parts of the world will have different regulations and, and timings. And it, it's all around yeah, working with our customers to understand that a recovery from a cyber event is very different than what you know, we've historically done from a DR event. And, and thinking and planning and having a separate run book and playbook for that type of recovery. Yeah, and I think one of the one of the things that um, that that springs to mind on that on that discussion, uh, my friend uh, Marcus Trardall has a uh, uh, you know has a conversation around this where um, he says you know you tend to think of hackers as you know the cyber event as being this sort of shadowy figure in the in the in the in the background right in a in a hoodie and whatnot in a darkened room and and so on and he says you know the reality is is much more along the lines of there are you know bots and bot farms and so they're all they're all running scripts and there could be hundreds and thousands of these things you know basically hammering away looking for weaknesses looking for gaps and you know one of the things on our side that we look at for the for the cyber resilience discussion is there are 
um, anywhere between 400 and 600 of these common vulnerability exposures, CVEs, a year um, that, that, the, that the industry gets notified about. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's interesting to me in, as well in that, you know, pretty much everything in our world today um, is, is a server, right? So, you know, an, an, an Ethernet switch has a CPU, it has memory, it, has, it runs an operating system, it has an application that does the switching and routing, it, it does I.O., it keeps some amount of data. You know, by definition, that's a, that's a server. It's a very specific server, you know, but, but to that point, um, a lot of these, these devices, storage arrays, actual servers, fiber channel switches, Ethernet switches, and so on, um, use common Linux uh, platforms for these, right? So we all get notified about these, these vulnerabilities, right? But what that means is then our software teams actually have to go review, you know, does it touch us? How hard does it touch us? What are we going to fix, right? And so, you know, when our teams are, are talking to, to customers about keeping pace with, you know, the latest, the latest gear and the most current updates um, that, you, that you possibly can, that's not just mom telling the teenager to, to clean their room. That's a, that's a serious consideration, right? Because those security vulnerabilities are there and, and the bots don't sleep. You know, this is not that, you know, the hacker is going to give you some downtime. The bots don't sleep. No, and, and certainly as, as you know, we, we see you know, artificial intelligence and things like, you know, chat GPT or from us with, with Watson X, and in learning around, you know, how do how do how do we leverage you know, artificial intelligence for for me personally from a storage perspective in, in trying to keep ahead of you know things um, that that the bad guys or bad actors I should say are, are are trying to leverage and and so you know we we continually either from the security side or for the storage side. You know, obviously we're trying to keep one step ahead and that just gets harder and harder to keep that one, 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 one step ahead. And, and so, you know, we've introduced, you know, capabilities into our, our storage virtualized line for doing inline data corruption detection. So as data is written from the host, uh, we have some algorithms that will look at, at, at those, those data patterns and go, this is different from what we saw before. Um, you should probably, you know, you know, do something and, and look at this from, you know, in, in investigation and in, in bringing in the the, the SOC uh, for for analysis and, and so alerting on, you know, what we suspect will be okay. We've seen these types of ransomware signatures before, so we're going to tell you about it as the data comes into the into the storage system, and we'll continue to evolve that. Um, as as we go and getting you know more real time because again the idea is if we can tell you that the data patterns are substantially different again whether it's entry mid range enterprise everybody needs this capability to be able to get as close to you know that that infection taking place so that you can minimize the scope and then minimize the recovery time that that, that, that you're dealing with yeah and I think. Um... An additional point for people to remember is there's legislation in multiple um, regions now that are going to force people to disclose when they pay ransomware, right? So companies, a lot of companies have kept very mum about it <clears throat> because nobody wants the the reputation hit for for having suffered uh, a breach. But but the the governmental side of it is, hey, that's customer data that got exposed, right? Um, you know, and they have a, the customer has a right to know that their data got exposed, and you know the the oh we it's okay we paid the ransom you know we're all we're all good and it's like you know you, you find yourself sort of looking at them going because you think these people are very honorable crooks and they won't use any of the data that they had access to while they were encrypting it and and as they were charging you the blackmail to to get your data back right why would why would you expect that they wouldn't just you know make additional profit by by selling that you know selling that data so i think some of the things around immutable copies and so on that um that that people are doing in the in the arrays um you know are are critical to that as well yeah for sure and it, it even goes you know above and beyond that you know again depending on you know who is behind you know delivering that ransomware uh, you know we certainly see a lot of state sponsored activity and if those state sponsored um, entities are on the you know thou shalt not deal with well companies could be fined so just because you have cyber insurance 
doesn't mean you can actually pay the ransom depending on who it is. Or you could be held liable for, okay, you're paying a state-sponsored nation that is on the blacklist. So, yeah. you know, it, it goes well and beyond, uh, you know, Okay, is it an ethical hacker that they're actually going to give you the give you the keys to the data back? And you know, about forty percent, fifty percent of the time, you might be lucky to to get half your data back. Very rarely is anybody going to get all their data back from a, even an ethical hacker um, the, 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 that's out there. And there's all sorts of various um, you know reports that are out there that show that just because you pay doesn't mean you're going to get it all back. All right, thanks, Brian, for that view and perspective on security and storage area networking. I think that everybody can appreciate that when we're talking about mission critical and business critical environments, security is something that is going to continue to stay with us, something that we're going to have to continually address. It is, again, very much that, that journey, not an actual destination. So with that, I'll thank you folks for your time and attention and hope you have a good day.